downstairs. We're going to wait for about 10 minutes, approximately. While we're waiting, let me just explain what's going to happen and uh, what the day entails. It's going to be very brief. It's going to be a welcome uh, to you people, ladies and gentlemen, all the bits and pieces. Uh, and then I will do an introduction, a proper introduction for Dr. Zimbardo. And then uh, we're going to ask our students who have prepared questions to ask him. Uh, I think it's about 11 questions to ask. Yeah, well, not that difficult. But <laughs> so just so you know, we're waiting for 10 minutes, so don't get, don't get impatient. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good evening, or good afternoon even, everybody. Welcome, uh, particularly our students from the International Business Management Program, all the psychology students that are here today, and uh, all our other guests, and obviously our esteemed guests. Uh, very, very quickly, anybody who doesn't know who Dr. Zimbardo is, uh, or has been hiding under, hiding under a rock for the last 50 years, uh, he is one of the most distinguished living psychologists in a nutshell. I'll tell you a little bit more about him. He has served as president of the American Psychological Association and he has published more than 50 books and 400 papers and articles, among them Shyness, The Lucifer Effect, The Time Cure and The Time Paradox. Triple majoring in psychology, sociology and anthropology, whilst at Brooklyn College he went on to earn his MA and his PhD from Yale University, both in psychology. A professor emeritus at Stanford University, Dr. Zimbardo has spent over 50 years studying and teaching psychology. His areas of focus, not in this, not in this, not in this particular order, include madness, time perspective, shyness, terrorism, and evil. Of course, he's also a doctor honoris causa at S4PS. <laughs> Best known for his controversial Stanford Prison Experiment, which remains to this day an important study in our understanding of how situational forces influence human behavior. The study once again became a topic of interest uh, when the reports of the Abu Ghraib prisoner abuse in Iraq became public knowledge. Let me just run through a few slides. Obviously, we welcome you. The other one is Dr. Honoris Causa of s s the final thing I'd like to say is Dr. Zimbardo currently lectures worldwide. Uh, I'm going to say that you Zumba dance as well, if you don't mind me saying so. Uh, he's a great Zumba dancer, apparently, and is actively working uh, to promote his non-profit organization, uh, the Heroic Imagination Project, of which he is a, a, action, a, a, hero, a hero in the making, I think. I think, yes. The project teaches people how to overcome human tendencies or natural human tendencies to watch and wait in moments of crisis. So on behalf of the International Business Management Program at SOPS, uh, please join me warmly in welcoming back to SOPS Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Welcome, Doctor. Say some. Uh, uh, I actually thought I was going to speak to 10 students in the international business program, Grazia students, and somehow uh, it has multiplied. Uh, but, but I'm delighted to be here. Um, before, so essentially the program is each student has a question about why psychology should be relevant to business. And I'm going to argue business is only about two things, making money and learning how to use psychology to make even more money. Um, so, uh, but the reason I'm here in Poland, I come almost every year, is every time I write a book, uh, my great publisher, PBN, uh, publishes it, promotes it, has me come. Uh, and the book I just, I just uh, published, they have some outside, is uh, Where Have All the Good Men Gone? So it's an analysis that I started some years ago in a TED talk, a short TED talk, five minutes, that I developed into an ebook on the demise of guys. 
And now we made it into a full-length book, uh, 5,000 pages. We have 30 pages of references and notes. Uh, and my colleague is uh, uh, a young woman, Nikita uh, Duncan Coulomb. Uh, and so between us, uh, she, I represent old folks, she represents young folks. Uh, and essentially, I'm go and the book is also published in uh, the UK, but not in America uh, so far. Uh, the American publishers are waiting to see, does it sell in Poland, does it sell in uh, the UK? And, and I know it will. Um, so I won't get into the details of it, maybe after we have our question. But th essentially what I'm saying is, I'm going around the world sounding an alarm, something really bad is happening to our young men. Our young men are retreating from the real world of people and places and things in nature to live their life in an artificial world of vo virtual reality. Uh, living on the internet, uh, living, playing video games, and now what's new is living, watching pornography 24-7 freely. Uh, so, so this is a major problem. It's not a phase, it's not temporary, because the video game companies and the pornography companies are multi-billion, million dollar businesses. They are, and there are many different ones. They're, they are competing with each other for the eyes and mind and fingers of young men. Now, young men play these games and watch pornography more because they're designed by men for male uh, values of dominance, aggression, violence, uh, sec uh, sexuality. Uh, and so, there, it's not that, I'm trying to think. I think the ratio of men to women playing playing video games uh, is at least seven to three and watching pornography, it's, it's even more. Uh, so it's not that video games are anything wrong. Playing video games in, at moderate amounts turns out to actually have been shown to improve cognitive skills, improve eye-hand coordination, improve uh, quick responding, and improve planning. The problem is the games very quickly become addictive. And so uh, it's hard for, the, uh, hard for young men to stop. And the same, the same is true with pornography. So if you want more, we can talk about this after, after we go to questions. Okay. You're in charge. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, so the first question, uh, I will go through them. They'll be on the board. I'll tell you who's going to be asking them so you know their names, etc. Uh, so the first one is from Kasha. Uh, and ideally all the questions are going to be the role of psychology in business because that's what we're interested in at the International Business Management Programme. So, Kasia. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Zimbardo. <laughs> uh, my name is Kate and I would like to ask you uh, a question about the role of psychology in business. I'm teaching uh, psychology to management students and usually, especially at the beginning of the course, they don't seem to be convinced that this knowledge will be useful later for them uh, in their career. I've noticed as well that some students are more eager than the others um, to study psychological basis of human behavior. So what are the possible reasons uh, for this lack of interest in psychology? And who do, in your opinion, who do you think uh, will be more, more successful business person or a manager? A person with this psychological uh, knowledge or skills or a person without it? Okay, uh, so that's three questions. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> so, um, so the reason for the lack of interest is typically they don't know what psychology is. Or they have an old conception, psychology is Freud and the brain. Between Freud and the brain, are two important uh, innovations called cognitive psychology and social psychology. The combination of cognitive psychology and social psychology, understanding what they are, what the findings are, what the, what the concepts are, is transformative for everyone. Um, and so I cannot imagine uh, being a business person and not understanding what, what we know about how the mind works and what we know about human relations. So, so, um, so firstly, it, it's, we, have to, uh, we have to teach people in business what psychology is. Now, may, maybe <coughs> they've had a lousy introductory psychology course. So then, <coughs> okay, it's not the case. Uh, so, um, but but I, th I think it's also a bias, that is, to think of business as focused on money, focused on finance alone. 
Uh, and I will, I will tell you later on about new research we have just done, uh, which shows that uh, uh, your financial health, the extent to which you are financially successful, rather than uh, you have a big mortgage, you have a credit card debt, depends not at all on your financial literacy, how much you know. It depends only on one thing, the psychology of your time perspective. Do you think psychological knowledge allows people to better distinguish between job candidates? And uh, is it easy to di differentiate people's ability to take charge, make decisions and lead others? If so, are these people more prone to manipulation, more egocentric and less sensitive? Um, so, um, so if, if you are an interviewer, interviewing job candidates for a job, you have an uh, internet company, you have a cosmetic company, you have a magazine company, whatever, um, essentially you're interviewing a person to try to find out what are their abilities, what are their skills. You also want to find out um, uh, how motivated they are for this particular job. You're also finding out, will they fit with existing people? Will they fit with the mission of your company? So essentially, it's really about making a decision. So one human being is looking at another human being, asking you some questions, informal ones, or maybe giving you a, a formal assessment, uh, to try to find out, uh, will Will you be successful if we hire you? Because if you're not, we're wasting a lot of time in training when we could have gotten another candidate. So it's a very, very important decision. Now, the, the reason it's complicated is if you are really a shy introvert, you're going to do a bad interview, most likely. Because the thing you're most afraid of is performing in public orally. And, and so that's a whole separate issue. So again, the interviewer has to find out something about you that uh, how do you feel how you feel comfortable and so um, but that the issue of fit means the interviewer has to understand the dynamics of the group that exists already you know uh, you know are they friendly are they are they all workaholics uh, 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 how well did they get along with each other and that whether or not you will fit your personality your your style now we have assessment. We have the Myers-Briggs uh, uh, type inventory. So here's a scale that's been used for, uh, for a long time in which we can identify different profiles of a candidate. And the ideal of the profile is uh, if I know the profile of the people in, in the, the unit already, we can see, we can predict better your fit. Um, now again, it's given if it's a if it's a very um, important decision, it's not like you're going to be the male boy, that, um, so we have to invest a lot of money in making a decision to hire you rather than her. Uh, so we're going to use a lot of information, something about your personality. We're going, to, we're going to depend on previous references. People who know you, what do they say about you? Um, uh, we're going to look at what, what, uh, what's your grades, what were you like as a student? Uh, so we want all possible information so that when we make a decision, the decision maker is also on the line. I, if my job is to do interviewing hiring candidates, every time I hire a candidate who turns out not to be good, it reflects on me. That, is, that, is, I, that I, didn't make, I didn't make the right decision. So I want to make the right decision and I want to use as much information a, as I can. But I'm saying at this point it's all psychological. Now, I could find out how much you know about calculus uh, if, if you're going to be in accounting, I want to know uh, what is your background in economics. So essentially, we're fitting you to, n to a social personality group dynamic, but then it's, you know, what is the nature of the job? Is, is it more, um, uh, more based with numbers, with money, with accounting, with finance? You know, th then, I'm g then I'm going to have to know y your economic background. I'm gonna, Obviously, you should have had a degree in economics right, rather than in, in, uh, in history. You can't really tell that from an interview, that this person is going to take charge, you know, unless, unless you have evidence in another business he did that. Um, uh, to take charge means you're willing to be the leader of a group. 
Are you willing to individuate yourself, stand out? Are you willing to take risks in return for better salary and so forth? Um, if you're willing to be a leader, part of your job is uh, to, be a, to be a successful persuader. The word manipulate is, is bad, but, but it, a good leader manipulates very subtly. I mean, a good leader has to move you from where you are to where the leader thinks you should be to be effective in, in our plan. So essentially, manipulation always sounds kind of evil, that you're manipulating people for, for personal gain. If I'm the leader of a project, the people who work with me, I have to manipulate them to work hard. I have to manipulate them uh, to want to do the work, to stay late, uh, uh, to work on the weekends, uh, to be willing to make sacrifices. Uh, otherwise, our project uh, will fail. Uh, we watched the, uh, the video of the Stanford Prison Experiment and we asked a couple of questions. Uh, and Alicia has a question for you. Yes. Dr. Zimbardo. We saw a chilling example of how power over others um, may change behavior. We know that some people working in corporations feel like they're in prison. Are there any strategies we can use in such situations? Yeah, so um, power is really one of the most important concepts for, for all of us, and especially in business. <clears throat> My definition of evil is the intentional use of power to do negative things, to harm, to hurt other people. And, um, and so some people are put in positions where by the nature of the position, they have more power over others. Teachers have power over students. Parents have power over children. Doctors and nurses have power over patients. Uh, uh, bosses have power over, over workers. And the question is, what do you do with that power? Obviously, the, good, the benign thing to do with power is to make the world better for everybody around you. So, that, so, so you can use the power in a benign way to improve the quality of life of all the people uh, in your network, in your context, in, in your family, in your school, in your business. Um, what? We do this here. We do this here. Uh, teachers say we do this here. We have to see, do the students agree? Uh, <laughs> But, um, but on the other hand, again, it's, it's power is very seductive. That is, how much is enough power? And for most people, the answer is it's never enough. So part, part of the question, I think, uh, uh, fits back into the old Stanford prison study, which is really all about power. What happens when you have students who are all equal, and I say, you have power and you have none. Uh, and the reason you have power is you're playing a role, you're a prison guard, and you are, you are prisoners. Uh, but it's the same, we could say, summer camp. You are the camp counselors and you are the campers. There are many situations in life where th the nature of the role, with the, nature, with the role comes power of various kinds. The critical thing that we learn from the Stanford Prison Study is it's very easy for people to slip into a role that that gives them the right or legitimizes for them power. So if you're a god, in the nature of the role is you have to have power over the people you are um, uh, guarding, containing, uh, keeping from escaping. Uh, but the question is, how much power is enough? And the answer is, it's never enough. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This is from uh, Carolina, also from the uh, Stanford Prison Experiment. We noticed that all of the guards in the, uh, that not all of the guards in your experiment behaved in a cruel manner. What distinguished those who are negatively affected by power from those who are not? Does the Stanford Prison Experiment teach us how to mentally deal with such situations? A good question. Um, so, um, what we saw emerge very quickly is that the guards worked eight-hour shifts. You know, some, some from, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, then the next shift came on 5 to 10 and so forth. And on each guard shift there were three guards. There were always nine prisoners, three prisoners in each of three cells. And then we had additional guards and prisoners that we could call in in, uh, in special circumstances. So when it began, 
This is 1971, okay? Before you were born. In 1970s in America, most students were anti-war activists. Most students, and professors, me especially, were against the Vietnam War, immoral, illegal. And many of them had demonstrations on the campus. And in many cases, the university called the police onto the campus to stop the student demonstration. And often there were physical, physical uh, challenges. In some cases, the police actually shot students. In some cases, students went to jail. So students thought, thought police uh, were um, uh, pigs. In fact, the oink oink, when they saw a cop, pe oink oink, you're a pig. Uh, and so nobody in our study wanted to be a prison guard. We asked you, we asked that when we're interviewing them, uh, some of you are going to be prison, some of you are going to be guard. Nobody wanted to be a guard. I said, guards are terrible. I didn't go, I didn't go to college to become a prison guard. You know, so there's not like a latent sad, sad, sadistic tendency, I'm going to get a guard, I'm going to have all this power. They, no, we don't want that. And, and on the day, first day, now these are also hippies. Everybody has hair, including me, big beard, hair all over the place. And, um, uh, and so, so the style was to be laid, uh, the expression of was to be laid back, not to be... And on the first day, it was difficult for the guards to get into the role, even though they had the uniform. And in fact, you can hear on the video, the guards line up the prisoners to say, okay, do push-ups, you know, do di different activities. And the guards would say, come on, you guys, let's take it seriously. No laughing. When I, when I was observing this uh, through the uh, on a video, I said, uh, no, I'm going to end the study. I mean, it's stupid. No, nothing's happening. And the key was the next day, the prisoners revolted. Revolted means that they said, we don't want to be a number. Because uh, prisoners, we took away the name. They, had, they ripped off their number. We didn't shave their head because the hair was so important. We put a woman's nylon stocking cap to, to, to minimize their, their uh, uh, individuality. And they took that off. And two of the three cells, they barricaded themselves in uh, so the guards couldn't come in. And then they made the mistake of yelling and cursing at the guards. And the guards come to see me. They said, what are we going to do? I said, it's your prison. What do you want to do? They said, we need reinforcement. So we call all, all 12 guards in, uh, 3, 6, nine, 12. And they break down the doors. They strip the prisoners naked. They uh, handcuff them. They, they tie them up. They stick, put them in a solitary confinement. And at that point, the guards the guards on the, on the ne next shift said, these are dangerous prisoners. Not students who did extreme. So now they are identifying those as dangerous prisoners. <clears throat> In their mind, they know <clears throat> that by a flip of the coin, they could be wearing the prison uniform. They knew it was a random assignment. We said, some will be this. But that all vanished. So again, it's, it's a dramatic psychological transformation once they said these are dangerous prisoners, from then on, it's we have to show them that we are in charge. One of the guards said, they were like our puppets, and we were puppeteers. That's the ultimate dehumanization. They're not people. They said, and we got our jolly. We got, we got a, a pleasure out of being puppeteers. You know? So again, it was all about control, dominance, and power, uh, which, which is part of the, part of the, the old... Uh, notion of male masculinity. Uh, and then each day it got worse and worse. The other, the other contributor to evil, was true at Abu Ghraib in the prison study, is that if you have to do a, a job for eight hours, in Abu Ghraib they work 12 hour shifts, it very quickly gets boring. Meaning it's the same old, same old day. And so what do you do to break the board, boredom? Something new, something unusual, something creative. So in Abu Ghraib, they say, you know, um, uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pile the prisoners up. We're going to make them naked. And then we're going to make a pyramid, <coughs> a naked pyramid. <coughs> Nobody has ever seen that. Wow, it's really... And so they did that, and they took pictures of themselves. But once you did that, it's all, the next day, it's old. People say, let's do the pyramid. Now we did the pyramid. What are we going to do now? <coughs> now we're going to have... Um, Masturbation contest. We line up all the prisoners. They all have to masturbate. Who has orgasm first? Once you do that, it's all. So each day, or each, I mean, this is each night, the abuses happen only on the night shift. They, they, some guard would come up with something creative, interesting. People say, hey, that's a cool idea. So partly, 
they were, they were entertaining themselves and what they were entertaining themselves was with the prisoners. So prisoners were their plaything. And the same thing happened in Abu Ghraib. The worst abuses in, in the Stanford prison study on the night shift, the worst abuses in, in Abu the only abuses in the night shift were on the, on the um, day shift. Now, back to the question. So on each guard shift, typically one guard was automatically became the alpha male. He took over, he started giving commands, started yelling at the prisoners and so forth. Now there's two other guards. Typically one of those was, in quotes, soft. One of them would say, you know, why don't you go easy on them or um, uh, would do little favors to the prisoner. Um, and so the key was the third one. If the third one, if the third guard who had been neutral the first day sided with the good guard, the balance of, of, of that, uh, that uh, unit would have shifted soft. In every single case of the three shift, the middle person always went to the power. Power attracts people. Uh, and it's dramatic, it's dynamic. The powerful leader gets things done, thinks of really creative evil stuff. And what that meant was each of the three shifts, it was one dominant alpha male, a beta male who wanted to be that, and then a good guard. Now, the good guard um, was good by default. Meaning, in one week, no guard, no good guard ever told, in quote, the bad guard, you know, you should back off. We're getting $15 a day. We could be playing cards. We don't have to be here yelling at them, making the world crazy shit. Uh, but they never did that. When the guards came in, they had to take their, their clothes off, put on the uniform. They had like a half an hour in the guard quarter. Just to, we had, we had the um, uh, hidden microphone so we could hear it. They never ever said to the, the other guard, you know, you're doing you're really over the top. You know, you're really abusing the prison. So no good guard ever challenged the bad guard. So in a sense, they were all bad guards. The only difference was how bad, whether they directly did something bad, but they allowed, they, they allowed evil to exist. And we see the parallel in many families. A father or a mother, in various ways, will be abusing or humiliating the children, call, calling them names. They're children, you're fat ass or you're dummy or something. And invariably, the other mate doesn't intervene. In fact, invariably, what the other mate does is say, mommy loves you. So they allow this evil to continue, or the good dad. If some t in some cases, it's the mother who does this. And, and we see, I, I see this in, in relationships of people I actually know personally, that, that so what does it mean to be a good guard? What does it mean to be a good parent? What does it mean to be a good friend? You have to be willing to stand up and confront the bully, confront the evil, confront the family member who is doing something which is uh, immoral. Uh, and, and in no case did they ever do that. Next. Managers are often instructed to reduce their negative emotions. But aren't negative emotions like anger a kind of engine for our motivation? Can a reduction in negative emotions be harmful to one's energy and managerial performance? Yeah, that's a good, that's a powerful good question. Um, um, it's really not the emotion, but how it's expressed. Uh, and again, um, uh, I mean, it's a whole area of, of, of um, in management of, uh, um, I can't, I'm trying to, it's um, making you aware of your emotional side and, and how you communicate that. So in, instead of just yelling and screaming, you know, you stupid ass, you know, how could you do that? Showing your anger, it's being able to press the pause button. And you feel it's coming up. And somebody has done something really stupid, okay? Um, you know, did something that is going to cost money to the, to the project or m make your whole unit look bad. So essentially, you press the pause button. You step back, take a deep breath, and then essentially the formula has been to tell the person how their behavior made you feel, makes you feel. So it simply it becomes descriptive. So rather than being angry, what you're doing is describing why you feel anger and why they have, they have been the cause of this. Uh, so it's, it's you, know, um, you know, when you don't pay attention, when I give you an instruction, when I see when I'm talking, you're looking out the window, uh, the consequence is we lost that contract. That makes me feel really angry. 
So now you know how I feel, you know your role in this, and then the next thing is, what are we going to do about it? So then I can say, how do you think we should proceed? So either you can say, um, you know, I promise to pay attention next time. I'm sorry I, I, I did this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you feel angry, you know, I feel I feel sad or I feel uh, rejected or something. So essentially, you use it to start a dialogue. That usually the, a show of anger ends anything. You know. Uh, and uh, this is a big problem with parents, not only business, that, you know, especially mothers who are overworked, especially single mothers who have two jobs and a big family, you know, the anger is a release. I mean, the, and the anger is you yell and you slap a kid in the head, <laughs> you know. Uh, and sometimes you do it in public, in, in, a, in a grocery store or something. And, and then the child is humiliated. So anger can have really negative effects when it's expressed uh, openly in, me, in public because it's often the anger of somebody in power, like the mother or the boss, against somebody with less power. So it's really, I realize that I have this power, and this is really what I want to do. I want to slap, slap that employee in the face, just like you know, my mother slapped me when I was a little kid. But, but you restrain, that's what I'm saying. The minute you think about, it, press the pause button, take a deep breath, and then say, here's how I feel. You make me feel really upset. Uh, and then you say, why? Uh, because, you know, when I talk, I know you're not listening. I know you're looking down. I know you're, you're I see you at your cell phone. <laughs> and, uh, you thought there was a tape, but this, this I can see right there. Uh, and so, uh, so essentially, uh, the best thing is, you know, I'm asking you, what is your solution? Now, I could say, I want you to pay attention. I want you to not use a cell phone. But it's, so for me, the, the better psychology is to say, what are we going to do the next time? You can't undo the, I mean, if you, if you screwed up before, that's over. I want you to know you screwed up, and, and what do you, what's your public commitment to, to the whole group, what you will do next time? And essentially, we want you to say, I'm not gonna do it again, I'm gonna you know, work harder, et cetera, et cetera. The other more general thing, I think, for all the students is, um, uh, at Stanford University, there are more social psychologists in the Graduate School of Business than there are in the, in the psychology department. All business schools, uh, uh, Harvard Business School, Wharton Business School, now have a major presence of social psychologists. Uh, and, um, and so most business schools have uh, two tiers. They have a master's program, master's a bit, and that's the big program. At Stanford, in order to get into the program, you have to have been in business for five years before you can even apply. So it's really a two-year program to sharpen your skills, and then separately is the PhD program. And the PhD program is to get you to learn how to do research on organizational issues. And those are usually smaller, smaller programs everywhere. Uh, so, why do you need psychology in business? Because there are good jobs waiting out there if you have a psychological knowledge, because psychology is central uh, to business. And psychology is interesting, it's fascinating, it's the most interesting thing in the world. A former student of mine who worked, f uh, was psychology and economics, worked in London for 10 years for the Barclay Bank. Their job was to get people to, to buy credit cards that had the highest interest rate. And, they would, and so they would make up these, um, these ads you know, like free for the first 30 months, uh, for, for the uh, first 30 days. Free plus you get a prize. And then, you know, the little print is, and then it's 30%, where every other credit are. And then also, uh, same thing with banks, invest in this bank. So they did it for 10 years, really cheating people. And then they, they had a, a, you know, a call to God. They said, oh my God, I'm doing terrible things. So they came to America, and I met with them uh, I met on some, some other project. And they said, now we want to do the opposite. We want to teach people how to make wise investments. We want to teach people uh, how to review um, the small print, how to, how to determine what's the best bank, what's the best credit card. So they set up a company called magnifymoney.com. You should look, Magnify Money. And then when we're talking, they said, no. and we want to teach people um, um, financial literacy, how to do compound interest, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you know, I know a lot of things. The thing I hated most was economics. I don't know how to do compound interest. I don't know any of that stuff. You know, I, I asked somebody else, I asked my wife to do it. I said, and I said, I said, I bet 
if you want to predict someone's financial health, meaning uh, uh, did they have a good bank balance, did they not have a big credit card debt, did they not have the house foreclosed, then I would bet time perspective is a better predictor. Because I know if you're present hedonistic, you're going you're gonna to go for something that looks uh, appealing, and you're never going to read the fine print. Uh, I know that if you're future-oriented, uh, you're going to be uh, weighing costs and risk. So we just did a study, and I, I will end with this, of 3,000 people, 500 in each of six nations, UK, uh, Brazil, uh, Italy, uh, Hong Kong, Germany, and America. Okay. We, didn't do, we didn't do Poland, because we, we didn't have a research at that time. And we, we gave them our, my time scale, we gave them a test of, of financial literacy, we get a measure of their financial health, and, for e and then we looked at men and women, we looked at um, uh, 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 baby boomers versus millennials, we did all these breakdowns. And the bottom line was, the fact that you knew how to, ha how to um, uh, that you had financial literacy did not predict to financial health. Time perspective did, and we could break it down for each of our time factors, time zones, with financial health. And then we could show which countries have the best and worst. So again, uh, uh, UK and Germany were the tops. Uh, America was somewhere in the middle. And at the bottom was Brazil. Brazil was the worst. Uh, and then, of course, Sicily. In Brazil, 70% of the population use 75% have credit cards. 70% of all Brazilians have their credit card now maxed out. That is, uh, that is every month, they c it's so much they can't pay, and each month uh, th they have to pay, uh, you know, maximum, like 22, 25%. And what they do is they keep taking out other credit cards to pay off this debt. So they can never, I mean, so, so th they will never ever get, at, get out of debt.